Welcome to the Tesseract Podcast, where we unlock your power to innovate. Our mission is to empower airmen, connect them to resources, and accelerate change across the Air Force logistics enterprise. Specifically, our team works as an innovation accelerator assigned to the Air Staff Logistics Directorate, where we partner with airmen to operationalize the new sustainment strategy. My name is James, and I'm going to be your host today. Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome back to the Test Rack Podcast. Today, I'm joined by retired Lieutenant General Jay Silveria. Jay Silveria currently serves as the Executive Director at the Texas A&M Bush School of Government and Public Service here in D.C. General Silveria, welcome to the show. Well, thank you, James. Good to be here. Could you introduce a little bit of your Air Force career and how you ended up where you are? Yeah, thank you. Uh, 35 years, uh, loved every minute of it. I started by graduating from the uh, Air Force Academy and uh, started out a career as a pilot and, uh, and enjoyed, enjoyed being the technical expert, but then had an opportunity to, uh, to, to get into command positions. So I ended up being a fighter squadron commander, a fighter wing commander, an AOC commander. Uh, as a general officer, a chance to, uh, to serve in a security cooperation role for Iraq, in, in Iraq. Uh, and then as a two-star, probably the highlight of my career, I was the deputy uh, CFAC, uh, Combined Air Forces Component Commander, in, uh, out of al Deed, which was in 16 and 17, which is really a highlight of my career, uh, where a lot of things, you know, there's a reason that you do that kind of assignment at the then point, is a 31-year point in my career, because... Uh, it required all of the time of 31 years to build, you know, the pull on all of the expertise uh, to do that job. And then I was the superintendent of the Air Force Academy in Colorado Springs, which was a remarkable, magical place. And then uh, I retired in 2020. That's amazing. Thank you for your service. Oh, thank you. What a career. Thank you. Uh, that the prerequisite for you know, 31 years of service and kind of steadily growing into bigger and bigger roles. Mm -hmm. That's really hard for someone my age to wrap, <laughs> wrap my head around, to be honest with you. <laughs> well, it, it's there. It's there. And I think, I think, I think it, it is important for younger airmen, uh, I anyone younger in the force to recognize that what you're doing now will build and will, you know, it's almost a Lego block approach, right? It, it will be additive. It will be a cumulative uh, adding to your call it kit bag or whatever metaphor you want to use is just adding to your skill set. Stuff you're doing now will matter 10, 20, if you stay that long, 30 years. It does, it does matter. I mean, when at that 31 year point, I felt like I was drawing on stuff in my undergrad time. I was drawing on stuff from being a, a captain, junior officer pilot. I was drawing on stuff from being a commander from war college. Um, but all of those elements add in to, to help you later. That's awesome. Um, so you said 92 mm -hmm. was graduating from USAFA, correct? No, 85. Oh, 85. 85. Sorry yeah. about that. Yeah. No. Um, and then you proceeded to have your entire CGO career um, in mostly the, mm -hmm. the 90s, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, and you were then 2001 uh, as 9-11 was happening. Mm -hmm. what, what was your current role? Then? I was a lieutenant colonel at uh, RAF Lake and Heath in, okay. in, the, in the UK. Yeah. Oh. I was an operations officer. Yeah. Oh, very, yeah. very relevant. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, could you talk, to, talk through a little bit of the kind of... Uh, the breadth of the change that occurred mm -hmm. overnight. What was your mission pre-9-11, and then what was your mission on September 12th? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think that's a great question because we, we lurched through some changes. But I think, for me, it, it, when you talk about 9-11, it's important to go back just a little bit further because Desert Storm that happened uh, for our force in 90 and 91 really was a major catalyst for change. I mean, that was when we when we deployed to the Middle East, really in large numbers for the first time uh, that we went through that exercise of moving forces forward in order to to. Uh, remove Saddam Hussein out of Kuwait and and after Iraq had occupied Kuwait and and very successful operation uh, in in Desert Storm and then the the following Desert Shield and then the no fly zones afterward of the 90s but it was that was the change that had taken us out of being the Cold War 
force that we really were in the 80s, that we were, we were focused on a single threat. Uh, we were studying other threats, but we were focused on the single threat. I mean, there was a time in the late 80s that I remember the squadrons, you, you had a base in Europe you knew you were going to, and you planned it, and you studied it, and you knew where you were going, uh, you know, logistically and, and tactically, you knew what you were going to do when you got, and then all that went away. Uh, overnight in in 1989. So I think the real change started with Desert Storm. And then certainly after when 9-11 happened, you know, it opened up our eyes to the, the fact that we had to now be able to react and move anywhere in the world. Uh, one of the, the best, it, it's a stupid story about my time when I was at Lake Heath, but through the 90s, we were, we were moving in and out of, of Turkey and the Balkans a little bit, but we were going to established bases. Uh, all re- facilities are already there. We knew what we were taking in and out, and it was and actually, you know, fairly. It was not that complicated of, of movements uh, that that we were doing, and so Lake and Heath decided that they needed a deployment center, and I'll never forget this. It was. It was a building, um, you know, we're in a large room now. It was maybe twice the size of this. It had a pad outside. Um, it had a counter. Then we were, we were very proud of ourselves and we probably finished it. Um, we probably finished it in early, in late 2000, early 2001, thinking that we were setting ourselves up to be deployment, to be expeditionary, right? We're going to have this room. We're going to have a counter where people can process through. Well, if you go to Lake and Heath, you know, X number of years later, if you go there now, the deployment processing center is a huge building with a massive pad where, where, you know, wide bodies can pull up and load up and it has a cargo yard and it has a processing and it has three, you know, theaters to move people through from the product. And I look back at that first building and I think it's a storage building now or something, or they made it a a gym for maintainers or something on the flight line the I, that we thought we were being expeditionary. And that just shows you what 9-11 did, that we didn't recognize the scale of what we were going to have to do after that. Going to unimproved bases, going to um, uh, places that we had didn't know about, taking things that, you know, enough facilities to set up, start from nothing in places uh, now, over time, we established some presence in Afghanistan and Iraq that was a little more, I'd call it permanent basing. But initially, it just showed how unprepared we were for that, you know, call it forward basing on a moment's notice without all of the all of the capability. I know that was a long answer oh, no, about, about 9-11. Yeah. Um, that's perfect. <clears throat> and those, those three things, you know, kind of being ready to move on a moment's notice and right. what do you need to bring and, and you're going to an unimproved place. That's stuff that we talk about uh, daily, like quite literally daily uh, in, in the current force. Um, did you see the change towards a more expeditionary force get captured kind of doctrinally or was it more that you had to do different things to accomplish the mission that you were given. Yeah, I think because the world changed so quickly and so rapidly, uh, or that we were responding so rapidly to the change that that I, the doctrine it took a little while for for us doctrinally to to catch up to to going to unimproved locations to to dealing with uh, those kind of conditions. So I think uh, the other thing doctrinally it took us a while to catch on was. Um, studying a broader array of threats for the, you know, for the, the fighter force, which I was in at the time, but studying a broader array of threats, a broader array of, of countries and capabilities and, and non-state actors and not, you know, because we hadn't really studied that kind of a threat in the same way. And so it really opened up our eyes that we didn't have the doctrine to think about how we would function as a force to move us which is one piece. But we also didn't have the doctrine to think about how we were training for threats that we hadn't really thought about. So that, I, and it took us a while, I think, to start to catch up. The timelessness of everything you're describing is just just absolutely amazing because obviously you could extend that. The, the obvious 
example of not knowing your threats kind of lies in maybe the cyber field today, but there's also just countless other ways that threat vectors are entirely novel today. Um, another example that we talk about a lot, um, or I talk about as, as a member of Tesseract dealing with software is uh, kind of these security concerns around large language models right. um, and poisoning or, uh, you know, the things hallucinating or just... right. In, uh, integrating them operationally in any sense to where you re- rely on them, there's so many things that could go wrong. Um, but just another example of, yeah, you never really know where the threats can come from, and you're eternally kind of learning, and the doctrine is always kind of slow to come out. Mm-hmm. Um, well, and and we consistently, we consistently underestimate, you know, a, a threat, and we consist- un, uh, consistently underestimate uh, capabilities. I mean, by the time I got to, as a two-star to to take on the fight in ISIS, against ISIS that would, at that point was in Syria and Iraq after ISIS had come down from the north in Iraq. And, and, and then we took on the fight to, to remove ISIS and, and really diminish their capability in Syria and Iraq. At that point, we were fighting a threat that had cyber capability, they had RPA capability, they had space connectivity. I won't say they had space capability, but we were fighting a threat that in, in a lot of ways we had not prepared for that was a full spectrum threat and they were a non-state actor so that the the complexity of the battlefield was was really was was really so different after 9/11 that complexity of the battlefield so what you've described there is both a, a little bit of the kind of short-term changes, mm-hmm. which is uh, the doctrine is not yet there. You're kind of like scrambling to catch up to to deploy anywhere. Right. And what 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 you had anticipated your expeditionary forces like was vastly different from what they ended up being like. Um, but then as uh, as ISIS and other threats in in the region begin to get more kind of complicated, and uh, they have more nuanced approaches and different threat vectors, it grows into this big thing. Um, the doctrine does it ever catch up? Well, I, I yes, it does catch up, and and I think it should catch up. I mean, we should force ourselves to do the intellectual work of of reflecting on what's happening, on trying to build and look forward. I mean, of course, you're not going to be able to anticipate everything, but still do the the work of reflection. Uh, you know, in our, in our places of education. I mean, I'm in one now. We can talk about, but uh, in in our own in our own joint. Uh, schools in our own, you know, Air Force schools, we should do the reflection and the hard work of, of trying to what just happened, what, you know, what did we miss? What can we anticipate? What are, what are, what are future trends? I mean, right now we should be reviewing uh, the disruptive technologies and, and the disruptive technologies will then, then affect you know, how we're going to handle those, how we're going to handle those in the future. And the disruptive technologies will then change and evolve. So there'll be, I don't know, another disrupting technology that we don't know about, but building in the, the idea of being reflective and, and reviewing what we've seen. And, and I, does it ever catch up? I think maybe that's not, maybe the point isn't catching up, but the point is that we should always aspire to try to catch up. I'm uh, extremely sympathetic to that perspective. Uh, we deal with um, we at Tesseract deal with people who are maybe uh, they can be skeptical, they can right. be negative about uh, really specifically the term innovation, right. whether or not uh, <clears throat> what it actually entails. They're actually skeptical of, um, but there's, there's often a perspective of we've tried this before. Ten right. years ago, there was this other organization that did this. Right. Um, but to your point, uh, you really have to, as an organization, kind of keep looking inward and keep responding to both externalities and things that are happening within your organization changes. Um, you know, people kind of in, in the younger generation have vastly different habits and have been, you know, they're digital natives. They've been raised with, with social media around mm-hmm. them. Um, and that represents opportunities and that represents threats at the same time. I also think uh, a lot of people talk about digital natives. Uh, I, I think that the generation also moves through and considers and handles information differently, right? Because of being a digital native, there's a there's a side effect that I don't think we talk about a lot, which is that uh, 
you know, you can find in, in, uh, in a younger, in our younger generation, people that are ability to, to deal with, you call it numerous screens or numerous data sources or numerous mediums that, that, you know, a few generations before were, were not used to dealing with, you know, the amount of information because it's about filtering where's the good information, where's the bad information and used to, used to that volume. And so I think you're right, the digital native, but I think it's so important uh, to to consider to consider what that means, and that's and we should take advantage of that, right? I mean, we should take advantage of a generation that thinks uh, differently about information flows that that are in front of them. Absolutely, conceptually thinking about this non-state active force that is, you know, mm-hmm. ISIS, right? Uh, going from what was it first in the kind of immediately post nine eleven phase, right. uh, pretty grassroots. Um, Formal in some ways, very informal in other ways. Um, same with same goes for organization. Um, by uh, 2012, you're stepping in the role as the director of security assistance mm-hmm. in the Office of Security Cooperation for Iraq. Yeah. What is yeah. the uh, what was the nature of that environment when you walked into it? Right. Uh, very different in that. Uh, major combat operations in Iraq had finished in December of 11. And so we were the force that moved in right after that. And I say force in that it was, uh, I think it topped out at somewhere around 180, 200 people total that were really managing the contracts of equipping the Iraqi military at the time. So uh, you can call it a, a Security cooperation, security assistance, which really is the terms for arms sales to Iraq and then helping them establish so that they have some capability. Uh, I mean, there's going to be a lot written, I think, in the future about how that how well that went. Right. And if we were if we were handling the intelligence or Iraqis were handling the intelligence of as ISIS built up in 12 and 13 before 14. But the idea was to train them so that they would have the capability to respond. So, but what I saw and what I, what I learned is, and, and we'll see, we're seeing that again today. We're watching it play out in Ukraine, but in a, in a call it a hot war versus preparing a force, is that as we equip a force, you can give them, you know, planes and tanks and ships and ammunition, and, but the supporting infrastructure that goes behind that. This is the, the, the first level, second level maintenance. This is the, the ability to supply and, and maintain a, a force that's moving. That, that, you know, call it logistics, certainly, right? But that infrastructure that we, I say we as Americans, completely take that for granted, right? We do that breathing, you know, we do that. We don't move without all of that. Well, just putting an ATACM, just putting a high Mars, just putting combat capability in the hands of somebody is not capability. That's an immediate solution because they need something in Ukraine's case and in Iraq's case. But the infrastructure behind to support that for any reasonable amount of time, I mean, um, you know, airplanes break, you know, Tanks break, you know, fight, you know, all of our equipment, it all breaks because it's, it's in a demanding environment and the infrastructure behind to support it. And then the other part about that, which we spent a lot of time in Iraq, was the idea of training the, the people in order to handle that. Once again, we do that and take it for granted. We move through it. We have the best training in the world. We have the best tech schools in the world. Uh, we have, you know, the, the best training environments for advanced training after we've done initial training uh, and, and a force that is, that is so capable because of the training. And, and so you have to have all of that. You have to train the, the people. You have to have the supporting infrastructure behind it. And you have to have the frontline combat capability. So I saw that upfront, close and personal. Uh, um, I, mean, I have tons of stories from that time, but one of them I remember they were having trouble with uh, um, one element in the uh, the M1 tanks that they had. They, they had trouble with some supply chain internal to Iraq. They had bought the supplies and the spare parts. 
and they had the t- and they had trouble m- getting the parts at the right place at the right time. A typical, you know, call it a logistics problem. So it's our job to figure it out, to help them, to go see. So we, we went to one of the supply houses that they had, supply warehouses. And there's, a, there's boxes of stuff, and it has dust on it. Right? If you go to a, a, a supply warehouse at a U.S. organization, the, supp- the boxes in the warehouse do not have dust on them. Because you order and you've built a structure that you know what you need and it comes in and then you supply that and then you resupply that. Things don't stick around and gather dust. In their mind, capability was having all of the supplies, not recognizing that the capability was about the function and the process of getting the supplies to where they were needed. And so we had to help them manage through that. It's a bit of the old... You know, you can make jokes about the old supply officer that, well, if I give it to you, then I don't have it, right? But the, it was that in, in, in just in the nth degree, that feeling like if they gave up the supplies, then they wouldn't have the supplies. Well, of course you wouldn't, but you'd have a fixed tank. And so that, the, the intellectual process of teaching that and the, training the people, having the infrastructure to, to support that, that's how you have, that's combat capability, not just the front end. Sure. You talk about uh, that we, that infrastructure has taken it granted, as granted, taken yeah. it for granted as Americans. Um, they had more of a scarcity mindset from lot. That's, that's a great way of putting it. That's yeah. a great way of putting it. Many yeah. years of uh, disorganized. Right. <laughs> right. Trying to get right. their stuff together. Um, and, and also, you know, to harken back to what in your introduction, you talked about how one of your positions required 31 years of experience. Yeah. What another great example of that, yeah. um, that, that, that all your experience, uh, not only working, you know, for the air force, um, and, and even I'm sure some kind of joint experience up to that point, yeah. but then working with partner nations to supply, equip, uh, and even kind of work together operationally to achieve mm-hmm. missions. Um, I'm sure that all led up to that point. Now, you learned a lot about the kind of sustained support required mm-hmm. to, to equip the Iraqis right, to right. defend themselves. What was your notion going into that, or what was the environment immediately before you took over that? Well, Iraq had been, we had major combat operations in Iraq uh, going on, you know, into 2011. And so... Uh, and then it was to turn it over to the Iraqis, and there had been a lot of military training leading up to that. And so, I, I had, I had not, I was not there, you know, in say in eleven, and I showed up right after. So I didn't experience as they went through their own transition, but I did experience where they had to teach themselves. Uh, how to, you know, how to sustain themselves, how to equip themselves. So that's what we were experiencing in 12, in early 12, in the beginning, because they, they, in a lot of ways, they didn't know what they didn't know. And they had to, they had to learn that in, in the beginning, because they, it's easy to look at us and see how we, we have our stuff and we have our, it's, and, and to mimicking that is not, it is not the. It does not get you the same result, right? The processes are also part of it. Uh, you know, the the supporting tail, the command and control of all of those things are, are a huge thing that we also take completely for granted. Uh, that we, you know, that we can trans translate orders through organizations to something else. You know, are we, are we, you know, exquisite at that? Can we always do it better? Well, of course we can. We can communicate better, but we certainly do it a lot better than non-existent. So I think they had to, they had to teach those processes too, which, you know, there, that process is just as important. In some ways it strikes me that you showing up a little bit after the kind of, uh, uh, scaling down mm. of our operations there was a perfect way to go about that because you, you showed up after they had already tried to pick up their own slack a little right, bit right, as the, the right. assistance, the direct hand yeah. on assistance yeah. cut back. So you yeah. got to see the contrast between what they would do if left to their own devices a little bit more than if you had been there since the very kind of day the, right. the assistance was right. stepped back. Right. That's really awesome. And it also strikes me that that, uh, 
that scarcity mindset thing is about kind of like a collective trust that uh, uh, what we've been saying is we'll take it for granted. Right. Right. You take it for granted if you're a supply troop that when you issue out a piece, then DLA will, right. you know, be able to right. reimburse. There's that. trust built in that we, you know, you if you're a frontline maintainer, I mean, you when you you trust that, you know, when you call for for a part that you're going to get the part and then they're trusted. It, right. You said the DLA is going to going to fill in. And yeah, you're 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 not. You're not worrying about well. I don't know if if I put this in and I'm not going to get another one, then I won't be able to fix the other the other jet that's down the line. You're not thinking that way. You know that I'm going to reach back. The tool's going to be there. What I need is going to be there in order to in order to meet the mission. And that's a really uh, that's a I don't want to say funny. It's an entertaining or amusing circular thought. Uh, f- mm-hmm. For the case of the warehouse officer that's holding on to that part, right. he's saying, "I'm not going to fix this M1 because there's another M1 that might break." And it's like, "Well, right. you, you have one part; you got to fix it." <laughs> right? Exactly. Exactly. But I think you're right. I hadn't thought about it in the terms of that. It's that scarcity mindset, but it is a it it is an entire lack of trust too. And and we we implicitly trust each other to have to have that to have a process to. Uh, along a you know call it that chain that that sequencing chain and that kind of uh brings us back to to the idea of doctrine catching Mm -hmm. up to because when you change the way that you conduct your business uh then sometimes those support organizations don't fall in line perfectly as you change what you do Mm -hmm. operationally right um and it's not that you lose trust but then policy quickly uh scrambles to to catch up. Right. Sometimes that right. waits for doctrine to develop before the policy finally mm-hmm. catches up, or sometimes the policy catches up because there's a de facto truth on the ground about how things need to get done. Right. Um, right. So, but I think we, I think we have to give ourselves the latitude and, and, and train ourselves in the critical thinking skills to, to give ourselves the latitude that the situation will not necessarily be as expected. Right. You know, expect the unexpected, whatever the right cliche is, that you're you're not going to enter a situation that that you could that will be clear, will be unambiguous, you know, that, that you know what it will be like. You know, you have to enter knowing that the situation will be unclear. It will be ambiguous. It, it will be complex. And if you enter that enter a situation like that, then I think the approach is a lot different Then you're then you're reacting to the environment as opposed to trying to adjust based on the environment change, if that makes sense. No, yeah. that makes a lot of sense because I, I joined the Air Force in 2020. Yeah. And I kind of started <clears throat> keeping up with the Air Force as an organization that was doing stuff since maybe 2016, 2017. Yeah. Yeah. And in this time, we have, by and large, maybe put my foot in my mouth here because I don't really know that much about <laughs> what goes on in the Air Force as a senior airman. Uh, but by and large, uh, there's been kind of a reaching for a kind of... Uh, uh, a way to adjust to a future threat that we can't yet define. Right. And this comes right. out in the kind of accelerate, change, or lose right. concept, which is like we need to be ready to do things differently while simultaneously optimizing what we currently do while staying legal and still having trust, not breaking too much things. And there's a lot of tension there, organizations. Well, a, and the organization should do everything it, it can to to be comfortable with the negative instability, Right. And, and comfortable with the un, you know, unpredictability. I mean, that, that, the negative instability, if you expect that, right, that in, in a natural situation of positive stability, it just, you know, it stays. But you expect that it's a negative instability, that, it, that it's going to change. I think your, your reaction is quite a bit different. And if, and, if, and if leaders can continue to allow people to innovate, be, be bold, not reckless, right? <laughs> be, you know, be, be fast, but don't speed, you know, that, that kind of thing that I think there's opportunity for people to react to things that they weren't expecting. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Makes a lot of sense. Um, passes the sniff test, but then often something that's very hard to, right. to see when right. it's actually in front of you and you have to make kind of a real decision right. that involves dollars or people. And right. Like right. That. Absolutely. That's kind of the job that we all signed up for, though, I suppose. <laughs> You're all too familiar right, with that. Right. In, in, this, in, this, in this decade, right? Did, you know, joining in 20, like you said, I mean, that's, that's what you're signing up for. I think, it, you know, we talked about the 80s. I mean, when I, when I was going to undergrad in the 80s, 
you know, everybody was taking Soviet studies, right? And the Soviet Union doesn't exist, right? Years later, just a handful of years later, the Soviet Union didn't exist. And everybody was taking Soviet studies. So, That's amazing. Yeah. I'm sure those last few years of Soviet studies, too, were probably increasingly incoherent with what was actually happening. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Because they were still, you know, focused on, you know, previous, the previous model that we were comfortable with. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, kind of shifting yeah. gears a little bit towards uh, the current situation, um, kind of the Air Force is gearing up for uh, what's known as great power competition, mm -hmm. which is looking back towards like a, a, a rival to the hegemon type of uh, geopolitical situation with yeah. that being uh, China. Um, how does uh, this kind of idea of this big organization uh, both being ready to adapt, but also still conducting its business um, and, and, and actually still adapting to various smaller geopolitical conflicts. How does that kind of uh, uh, present itself in the current situation from your perspective? I, I think what it means is that uh, more, more than ever, we have to think across an entire spectrum. I mean, we, you know, the Air Force... Uh, you know, you know, we love our airplanes and they don't solve all the problems. Right. And, and more so we have to we have to recognize that perhaps what's going to be on the tip of this will be working with the Space Force for some presented space capability, uh, some element of, uh, of cyber you know, capability makes a difference. I mean, I, I think more so than ever, we have to ha expect our airmen. I think it's going to be much harder on someone joining in 20 as you've done. I think it's going to be much harder on airmen to have a better understanding of full spectrum capability, uh, meaning spectrum of, of air power. And when I say air power, air power now is, you know, I consider the elements that are in the Department of the Air Force. I mean, that, that range all of that, along with the information warfare that has to be done, the psychological warfare that, ha that, that has to be done. And then the ability to work with other services in, in other countries, that, that will never, it, it will never go away. Yeah, it, we will always need to work with other services because of capabilities that, that the Air Force doesn't have, that the other, other services need us to support them. Um, mission in cases where there, someone is, is primary on a, on a certain mission set, and we should take that that role exceptionally seriously where we're supporting others. So I think it's going to be even more complex in great power competition because it's going to require, call it vertical and horizontal response. It's going to require services. It's going to require capabilities. And there will be no single capability that will be a, that will be a solution. They will have to be, they will have to be complementary. I would, I, sometimes when I talk, I talk about the idea that, if you think about, let's take a simple example, such as a, an air defense position on the coast somewhere. <clears throat> and there's a lot of ways to impact that air defense position on the coast. You could blow it up into little pieces that has some satisfaction. <laughs> but what if the person who works there is on their way to work and they read something in the paper that questions what they're doing. What if on the way they get some weird message on their phone? What if when they get to the gate to go in there that their swipe card doesn't work? What if when they go to look at the radar, the radar works some, but it's got some erroneous data on it. What if they lose connectivity to their, to their higher headquarters? I mean, all of those in the information warfare, in, in, in space capability, in cyber capability, you know, all happen way before they're looking to do their, call it primary mission of air defense, looking for a threat coming in. And so I think we have to, we, in great power competition, we have to think about deterrence in a different way, and we have to think about our capabilities in a much different way. Yeah, that is hard. Uh, I truly cannot imagine being a leader that's maybe briefed on some potential offensive capabilities and then you ultimately side with we should sell them some printers <laughs> <laughs> I, I know i know and the printers right will, right, right. Will exactly undermine. right right i know i know it's, <laughs> and it, but it's a mindset of 
you know, that there, that there, ha- there's so many ways to affect, you know, in my silly story of that one position, there's so many ways to affect that one position and, and, and we have to consider all the options. And I think great power competition is going to demand that, uh, of us to have any effect in that because the complexity will be so high. So we've talked, uh, uh, a little bit about kind of collective organizational yeah. trust and inner yeah. organizational trust and kind of uh, both the horizontal and vertical integration. Um, how does this play into kind of broader governmental roles? Um, we're sitting here in the office for a and uh, mm-hmm. the School of Government and Public Service. Yeah. yeah. How does that play into what your kind of day-to-day looks like? And well, I, I was lucky enough to to join Texas A&M and as they uh, set up a, a graduate school here in Washington, D.C., and the graduate school is focused on international policy and national security and, t- and intelligence studies. But it's focused on early career and mid-career uh, professionals. So three quarters of our students are working professionals in Washington, D.C. who are taking their classes at night. So they are already in the national security space. So one of the things that that I see that we enjoy is we have our own sort of mini, miniature interagency going on. You know, we have people in the classroom. There might only be six or eight of them in the classroom, but... Two of them are from DOD, one's from state, one's from treasury, one's from a think tank, one's from a private sector. Uh, So they represent in a microcosm of those six or eight people, the problem, the solution set, you know, will come out that way out of an interagency or, or, you know, cross matrix solution when we get to our national security um, problems. And so... I, one of the things that we really want to encourage is that exactly, that somebody should, should leave here not, not thinking in terms of a, of a narrow solution set for national security and intelligence problems that they're taking on. They ought to think about, well, there's, there are solutions in other areas or there are, there are other agencies with capabilities. And, and, and in fact, you know, the, the sum of, you know, whatever the, the, the sum is greater than the, you know, the, the, the than the parts. And so they, they should get to, they get to see that firsthand because they're someone from DOD who's sitting next to someone from the state department and they're talking about the same subject matter. So I think that is so important for us to build that space in our curriculum for people to study not just different topics but to learn from each other in a much different way the uh the a wise man once told me the secret sauce at mit is to just get the smartest people in the world and put them together <laughs> right. uh, and then they'll, right. they'll figure it out right <laughs> they uh, they will figure it out the one of the other thing in our secret sauce that we enjoy is that we we want scholars so we have a number of professors that are world-renowned scholars but we also have professors that are practitioners who spent 30 years in the national security space in the intelligence community, and they bring the practical experience and in, in their, own, their, their own experience base to those conversations for the students. Now, one, one is not enough. You, just the scholars doesn't teach you the, the practical elements, and the practitioners you know, can't give you the doctrinal and the research base foundation. But when you put them, two of them together, it's actually much more powerful than one of them apart. So that's, that's the secret sauce that we go for is the scholar and the practitioner uh, for the students to experience both of those conversations. That's awesome. Sir, what is the best part about public service? I, it's, it's the chance to have an impact and the chance to be part of something bigger than yourself. And, you know, I, I was privileged to do it as an Air Force officer and loved every minute of it. But it's that idea that I can contribute in some small piece, but it's to something much larger and to enjoy that. And then the, the privilege to do that now with A&M with students, 75% of our students are going to be in public service in some way. So it's the same conversations. They're going to be working as civilians in a number of agencies. Well, we have a number of military officers uh, also uh, to hear them have the same conversations about about being part of something bigger. So the, the chance to continue to 
to help public servants, help those that are that are uh, advancing their career in public service. So I that's I'm pinching myself that I get to do this. That's awesome. Yeah. And you've gotten to yeah, as you've said, you've gotten to kind of uh, hear about the different aspects and different ways that they can that public service can play out because you get representatives from a bunch of different departments from and stuff. so many different departments what's your favorite part about your time in the air force then as a specific department it goes just with what i said about the idea of being part of something bigger is being the favorite part is being around people who also think like that and so People that that and so many people answer, well, the people were the best part of being in the Air Force. Well, to me, it's because of the type of people that I was around that I had the privilege to serve with. And and they were all great people. But the fact that they were all the same type in that they were all focused on wanting to have an impact, wanting to make a difference and wanting to be part of something bigger. And so to be around people that were like that, that that shared that same idea, that was a a privilege every single day. General Severia, thank you for joining me on the show today. James, thank you very much. Thank you for the time. Thank you so much for listening to the Tesseract Podcast. This show is how I started to learn about enterprise-level strategy and the innovation ecosystem within the Air Force, and I hope we passed along some learning to you with this episode. If you'd like to engage with our team, make sure to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, and connect with us on LinkedIn. Any references to trademarked, copyrighted, or protected products or services such as books, movies, or businesses are used here for the limited purpose of education and professional development of Air Force Airmen. If you have any questions, please contact us at www.tesseract.af.mil.